Okay, welcome to this uh, session uh, on productivity that's been uh, organized and run by, by the Productivity Institute. Uh, I'm, I'm Tony Venables, uh, Research Director of the Productivity Institute. I'll be uh, chairing this. Uh, and we have five, five speakers, uh, all of them uh, key, key players uh, in the Productivity Institute. Let me uh, briefly introduce them in, in the order in which they're gonna be speaking. Uh, first, uh, Bart Van Ark, who's uh, director Managing Director of the Institute, uh, based in the uh, University of Manchester. Uh, then uh, Professor Mary O'Mahoney uh, from, from King's in London, uh, Professor Stephen Roper, uh, Warwick, uh, Rebecca Riley, Professor also, of course, uh, at, at King's, and then I'll come in again at the end. They're all, they're all key players uh, in, in the Productivity Institute. Um, what I want to achieve with this afternoon session is really two things. First, to sort of inform people uh, something ab about the Productivity Institute. It's, it's a relatively new institute uh, established by, by the ESRC, um, but spreading the word about the Productivity Institute is important. Uh, and second, and more important for this afternoon session, is actually to start uh, a discussion amongst the panelists and with the audience about productivity uh, and the UK productivity puzzle, so-called, and some of the challenges uh, that are faced in the UK. So I've asked each of the speakers to say a little about uh, their research programs, their research activities uh, in, the, in the Institute, and then to say rather more about their current research on productivity and uh, put some ideas out uh, on the table in front of us in front of us all to discuss. Okay, so with that brief introduction, uh, let me go straight to, to Bart, Bart Van Ark. I've asked him to say rather more about the structure of the Institute uh, as well as his own research. So I'm gonna give him a bit longer than the others. Uh, one other thing I should say by way of introduction, uh, I will endeavor to manage both timing uh, and some questions. I anticipate this will be extremely challenging but if you bear with me, uh, we'll see if we can get maybe a question or two after each of the speakers and hopefully some, some time for Q&A uh, at the end. But over to you. Right, thanks, Sonny, and thanks for all my colleagues joining here and for you attending this session. And uh, I think I've been tasked with sort of two things that I've got three minutes more. One is to talk a little bit about the Productivity Institute, say a few more things about it for those of you who are not so familiar with it. It's a somewhat different kind of research organization than other research organizations we're familiar with. But then I also spend a little bit of time on talking about some work that I'm doing myself at the macro and sort of the, the macro diagnosis of productivity and where we are on, on that and the sort of latest uh, issues and latest insights that we got in from that. So um, you should be able to see my, my screen. If that not, I'm sure that Tony will shout that's not the case. Um, this uh, slide here is a, a very uh, a short summary uh, of what the Productivity Institute is about, and you can already see some differences with other ESRC funded institutes. It's relatively large. It's a big investment of 32 million pounds over a period of five years. It's a relatively long period. It involves a fairly large group of collaborators. There are eight uh, Russell Group universities participating, as well as the National Institute of Economic and Social Research and ESCO, the uh, Economic Statistics Center of Excellence. Um, we have a, a large number of individuals involved in the research, uh, probably uh, up to about uh, um, uh, 80 of them. There are 40 co-investigators, another 40. And then very importantly, there is a very large engagement program around this. And this is really engagement with the policy community, but also with the business community. And I'll come back to that in a minute when I talk about our our regional uh, productivity forums. I'll talk a little bit about the themes there in the middle as well. Now, every institute has a mission, so we have one as well. I'm not going to read it out to you, but I, I just sort of highlighted a few words that are important. The, it's it's broad-based productivity. It's about sustainable and inclusive productivity growth. I mentioned the, in, in the uh, engagement and involvement of um, policy and business makers, and that's uh, of policy makers and business executives. This is not just about us bringing research to them, but also them giving us better ideas about what are the relevant research topics that we need to research. Um, uh, th there will be some emphasis, although you know, uh, productivity is a topic that economists are very engaged on. 
uh, there are other disciplines that are contributing to this quite importantly. I should mention, for example, uh, quite a few of our uh, COIs are in business, economists in business schools, work intensively with management and innovation researchers. Uh, there is a big uh, group of political scientists uh, involved uh, in, this, in this work as well. So there's room for interdisciplinary work, uh, as well as, uh, as I mentioned, the broader uh, link with issues like living standards and well-being, uh, and of course, also the regional specificities. One thing I should mention there at the top, uh, uh, at the bottom left, is the need for developing a productivity narrative. When you engage with the business community, or perhaps even with the policy community, the first question is, what is productivity? And we economists sort of have a definition that we can work with, but it's not the definition that resonates very well outside the academic world. So a lot of the work that we're doing in our engagement work is to try to get these narratives clearer and to link these narratives up with, uh, with the thinking around that in the academic world. I mentioned the importance of the, of the regional uh, element, and Tony will speak about the regional issues a bit more, but we have, uh, as part of this, established eight regional productivity fora across the uh, nation, five of them in England, and then uh, each uh, one of each in uh, the three devolved nations. And each of those are, each of those forums which are basically business executives and local policy and regional policy makers are supported by one of the universities in the Institute uh, providing and, and really making the content uh, relevant and, and feed the questions into the research program. The Institute also has a productivity commission, which is basically a group of experts uh, uh, linked to the Institute in one way or another uh, that really tries to identify what are the key policy topics that come out of this. The policy domains are very, very broad when it comes to productivity. It's not just uh, the treasury and base, uh, but includes many other departments of government, as well as uh, a, a huge amount of um, uh, regional and local government entities that are important here. The Productivity Commission has done a couple of sort of uh, scope uh, setting sessions in the past year and is now about to uh, publish their first report before the summer with the sort of key policy domains that they will uh, have further evidence sessions on and, and, uh, and hopefully you'll see more of that coming along. I'll spend a few more words on our research program because you'll see some of that coming back in the presentations that, uh, that uh, Steve and Mary, Rebecca and Tony are going to give in a minute. Uh, currently, we're thinking uh, in the program uh, about eight themes, and you can sort of organize them in a couple of buckets. So the first three themes, human capital, knowledge capital, and organizational capital, is basically about investment in the intangible part of the economy. I'll come back to that in a minute because that's actually part of the the research that, that I'd like to present to you uh, in a second, but it's that intangible component of investment that is driving a lot of the research that, that the Institute is currently doing. Now, the importance of geography and place, and Tony will again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, come back to this, um, um, the large regional differences, which frankly we see everywhere, but also the peculiarities around the regional differences in the UK, for example, the underperformance of second tier cities, uh, in the UK is something that uh, has very specific attention. I also mentioned the importance of uh, policy and institutions and governance. That's why we, we really need uh, political scientists in this field. So this is not just about the current policy portfolio, but very much also about what is the institutional and governance framework about where policy is being made. So if you think about the leveling up white paper that uh, recently appeared, we had three contributions uh, ahead of the publication of that paper that we're dealing with issues like how is industrial policy, what is the institutional setting around industrial policy making? What is the uh, institutional setting around devolved government? Uh, you know, where does devolved government come in when it comes to productivity? And there was also a paper around fiscal de decentralization and what that was meaning in light of the leveling up. Now, measurement and methods, we partner directly with, with ESCO, which Rebecca is, is leading us uh, as well, and leading our measurement and methods theme. And she will speak about a couple of topics related to that theme. And then last but not least are the bigger underlying issues of it's obviously the transition to net zero, but also the digital transformation process. And perhaps the combination of those two are quite important. Now, before I uh, uh, now zoom in a little bit more, uh, the few minutes that I've left on some of the research that I would like to present, I'd just like to, again, go back to this issue of uh, what productivity is and why it matters. So, you know, again, as economists, we think in terms of economic productivity at some measure of output, usually that's GDP, although there's more discussion now about sort of more extended uh, concepts of GDP, 
and some measure of input, which usually is you know, capital and labor. And you know, if we want, we include intangible capital as well. But frankly, when you begin to think about sort of the more broader impacts of productivity on, the, uh, on society, you, you could define the term around societal productivity. It's basically how in a particular regional setting, we are actually using our resources more broadly to, research, to achieve a certain outcome. That can be GDP, but it can also be improved living standards or health and well-being and things like that. And so you can see on the right-hand side, a chart coming from one of the ESCO discussion papers produced uh, two, three years ago, where you can see that if you extend the concept of GDP to broader concepts of, uh, of outcomes, you can begin to take on board issues like distributional effects, uh, welfare effects, and sustainability effects. And again, that's, that's a, uh, part of uh, the research that I think is very important for us. So it shows the broad-based nature of what we're doing. Okay. Now I'm going to use my last few minutes to talk a little bit about sort of what are our most important macro insights here. This is a slide which sort of represents the common wisdom, if you like. So we know that UK, that productivity has slowed down in most advanced nations. You see that in this chart, it's just the level of GDP per hour worked. But you can see that the UK has been lower than some comparator countries here. You see Germany and the US and the Netherlands, but you could put other countries, UK is always at the lower end. And it also suggests that the UK has slowed more compared to its growth performance in the, uh, the pre-financial crisis period. In fact, the UK probably showed even somewhat faster productivity growth than most other countries pre the financial crisis, but it's slowed more since. And the common wisdom is that this is partly the result of a systemic underinvestment in key components of tangible and intangible capital that we've had a proportionally large number of low skill and low productivity jobs in the UK that we have a relatively long tail of low productive firms across nations, uh, across industries, and that we have many areas where there's a sort of persistent low skill, low wage, low productivity equilibrium, um, and that includes the second tier cities and many rural places. So that's the common wisdom. And a lot of uh, what our research currently is showing is, is, is largely confirming some of these issues and driving it further down. But, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on sort of what the latest numbers are showing on this diagnosis and that we perhaps need to rethink a little bit more about what sort of the macro numbers are actually showing us uh, at the moment. So these are some of the very latest numbers that are being produced by the conference board, one of the producers of these uh, uh, global productivity numbers. And uh, what you can see from this chart is the growth uh, performance uh, in the period 2000 to 2007. So that's the blue bars here, um, uh, the pre-financial the pre crisis period, and then the growth performance post-financial crisis. So I started there in 2011. So we're dropping the financial crisis itself from this comparison. Look at 2011 to 2019. So what you see, slowdown everywhere, but the slowdown has been relatively large in the case of the UK. Uh, compared to other countries, although it's also been quite large in the case of the United States. We also see that a very common theme around the slowdown in capital intensity, and this is, this is tangible capital intensity, so it's just machinery and equipment and including ICT capital and things like that. And again, you see a relatively large slowdown in capital intensity in the UK, but coming from a pretty high growth uh, performance in the pre-crisis period. So perhaps not completely uh, uh, out of whack compared to what you're seeing in other countries. TFP slowdown also is very widespread, although not that visible in the case of Germany, although it's slow there as well. I mean, 0.4% isn't a lot of uh, uh, TFP growth anyway, but in most other nations, we have seen the slowdown. And in some cases, like France and the EU 14, which is basically all the most advanced EU countries except the, uh, the UK now, and the US, we have seen that slowdown as well. So you see some confirmation here, but one thing that you, you do see is that this slowdown in capital deepening, intangible capital deepening, perhaps is not extraordinary compared to other countries, particularly given the fact that it has come from a pretty high contribution that it was making pre-financial crisis. We also have the benefit now of a new data set of intangible capital being produced by Lewis in Rome uh, at the European Commission funding. Uh, so this is the, the very latest numbers that are available from, from Lewis, uh, giving you actually numbers for some countries up to 2019, but here I left it until 2018. And that allows us to not only look at tangible capital, but also look at intangible capital. Now, the numbers are slightly different. If you add intangible capital, your output concept and your labor productivity concept is changing a little. 
Also in the case of the UK, these numbers are the vintage before the revisions that were made by, by ONS. So that makes a bit of difference as well. But again, you can see here uh, the, 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 the labor productivity growth rates, output per hour, slow down everywhere. But then when you look at the contributions, we basically broke it up into labor quality contributions. So it's basically changes in skill levels. And then the reddish parts of the bar is the sort of tangible capital contributions. IT capital is the dark red and non-IT capital is the light red. And then you've got the intangible part, which is the, the dark yellow is basically what the uh, national accounts are measuring in terms of intangible. So this is R&D and, uh, uh, and software pr uh, primarily. And then the light yellow is the non-national accounts intangibles, things that are not yet included in national accounts, but that we can measure. Um, uh, and that includes other types of uh, uh, economic competencies, for example, like management competencies or organizational competencies and so on and so forth. So again, you see slowdowns everywhere. Uh, but you see in the UK that uh, the slowdown in intangible capital uh, has been uh, relatively large, particular in relation to the total factor productivity growth rate. So you see that the amount of intangible capital contribution we still have relative to the TFP growth rate is relatively limited. Now, there's a lot more to say about this chart. And if people have questions during the discussion, I'm, I'm happy to come back to that. I just want to end with uh, a few observations on the basis of those charts, because I do think that in the we have a tendency sometimes to think that all the problems that we're looking at are UK problems and we need to have a UK based solution to it. And I think a lot of the research and including those charts has shown that a lot of these problems are actually global causes or at least causes related to the most advanced economies to make it a little bit more narrow uh, than that. But there are some UK specific issues as well. So for example, the labor productivity slowdown is quite widespread. But in the case of the UK, it's, it's, that slowdown is relatively large, but it is so large because it comes from a pretty good growth rate uh, pre-financial crisis. The slowdown in capital deepening is ubiquitous. You see it everywhere. But the slowdown in capital deepening in the UK perhaps wasn't out of, of the extraordinary if you compare it with other countries. The slowdown in intangible capital deepening was less in most countries than the slowdown in tangible capital deepening. But in the case of the UK, that slowdown in intangible capital deepening was relatively large. So that is, a, that is something that really uh, points at the sort of specific UK issue that we see this relatively large slowdown in intangible capital deepening, particular in relation to, to total factor productivity growth. Uh, Pre-financial crisis, TFP growth was the dominant source of growth. That's true everywhere. But in the UK, we see that this there is a correlation that seems to be a correlation between total factor productivity growth weakening and intangibles growth weakening. And that of course is partly related to the nature of our economy. Our, our economy is relatively strongly intangibles driven because of the relatively large share of the services sector in the economy. So slowdowns in intangibles and slowdowns in TFP tend to, uh, to uh, go, go together uh, quite, quite substantially. Now, overall, uh, the last uh, bullet point here, the productivity slowdown globally was really a combination of weaker investment, weaker capital deepening, if you like, and slower TFP growth. But globally, we see that the relative importance of tangible capital has actually increased. Whereas in the UK, the total factor productivity slowdown is more predominant, more strongly related to uh, weaker intangible capital deepening. So Tony, let me stop there. I'm not sure if I used up my minutes. Uh, happy to go a little bit more deeper in some of these data, but we could do that at a later point during the discussion, if you like. Thank you, Bart. Uh, very prompt. And uh, thank you for emphasizing the role of intangibles and the slowdown there. Um, clearly an important issue. That I, I think we'll be coming back to uh, in, the, in the next hour, the remainder of the hour, and certainly in the year in speech research program. Uh, let me remind the audience um, that uh, to, to submit uh, questions, uh, which I think I'll be able to see. Um, whether our questions, I'll try and take some uh, after each session, uh, but if uh, after each presentation, uh, but if they don't get asked, we'll have time at the end, I'm sure, to uh, to, to to pose them. So so do put uh, quest questions up uh, through the system, please. Okay, let me now move on to, to Mary. Perfect, okay. great, okay. Okay. Mary. Okay, so um, thank you for inviting me to, to speak on this uh, topic. So I'm talking about human capital and skills and, and in particular, particular the uh, regional skill um, dimension. Um, 
I've been working on productivity for almost 40 years, as long as BART has. We, we kind of started together. Um, and um, in, in every aspect of work we've done with international comparisons, the EU CLEMS work um, and various other work we've done, skills have always been an important dimension. Um, and so um, it's not, it doesn't come as a surprise in this particular uh, project that we also have a, a theme that's specifically devoted to, to, to human capital. Um, and particularly um, skills are important when you have rapid technological progress like we have at the moment and, and, and the, uh, the digital economy um, and all that. So um, the, this team um, has a number of, of projects um, and I'm not going to talk about the, I'm not going to list the projects or talk specifically about other projects, but they do um, employ a range of methods from the kind of quantitative analysis that we are doing to um, using um, case studies and uh, inter firm level interviews. And um, so we hope that at the end of this, we'll have a, a clear idea of um, what skills are important for the, for the digital economy and some idea of what the policy implications of, of what we find. Okay, so I want to talk here about just one project. Um, and this is joined with the measurement and methods theme because it's a lot of it is, is concerned with the measurement of skills. Uh, which we call the demand and supply of, of skills um, uh, in, in the UK, the re a regional analysis. And we're, it, we're looking here at evidence from new data sources. So the demand side, we're measuring using data from job vacancy platforms. There's a, an enormous amount of work going on at the moment on, on using these job vacancy platforms. So we're kind of adding to that. And then the supply side, we're using a range of sources, um, including the LFS, the um, UK um, household longitudinal survey, which most of us are used to calling um, Understanding Society, but it's changed its name, and the LEO database. So let me start with the demand side, and this is uh, work mostly by my PhD student, uh, Elodie Andrew, and Mal Gazata Kuzera, who uh, was a PhD student at, at Cambridge. So they've been working with the burning glass data. Now, I, I guess as so many papers use the burning glass um, uh, database and um, it's a very rich database that um, give a huge amount of information not just about demand for skills but um, lots of other aspects of intangible capital as well in terms of um, the, you know the type, the type of skills but um, it, it does have some um, drawbacks and, and one of the, the problems with the burning glass data is it doesn't have a lot of information on educational qualifications in the in the kind of data if you if you purchase data from burning, uh, from burning glass, um, you'll get these variables, but um, the education qualification that is developed by um, burning glass itself is not very rich. And not we've, as we found, not very accurate. So what, what um, Elodie and Mal Gazata have done is they've gone back to the text, uh, the burning glass text, the actual text of the advertisement and re estimated the educational qualifications. Um, now, not every ad has educational qualifications, but um, in the burning glass data that they, they that you can purchase, only about 20% of ads have educational qualifications. When Elodie and Al um, went back to the data and did their own text analysis, uh, they cut this up to about 45%. So it's a, it, it's a, it was a well worthwhile exercise. And then they also use um, machine learning techniques um, to uh, identify um, tech jobs. They call tech jobs and. Uh, I can't even begin to go through the, 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 com the complexities of that in this very short presentation, but um, they're using various um, uh, text analysis, again, again linked to some extra, uh, work done by um, external people. Okay, so they've, what they've done is they've put together this very large data set, and um, the kind of questions we want to ask from this data set are really, have there been any changes over time? Uh, and in particular across the UK, because we're very concerned about the regional analysis in this work, in, in the pre prevalence of tech skills and the education requirements of, of jobs. So we want to look at, have, have jobs become more complex? And particularly one issue that we, we really would like to get a handle on is if um, there's, there's a lot of literature out there that says that uh, graduates are now working in non-graduate jobs, non-graduate occupations, but it, is, is the work they're doing actually different? Are the skills that are required by the graduates and non-graduate jobs different from uh, non-graduates and non-graduate jobs? So that's the, um, the kind of questions we, we want to ask. Um, however, I'd like to um, just talk about one um, 
application of this data that LOD has, has put forward, which is to look at um, uh, the use of skill, um, techie skills and education uh, as a dimension for which firms can, can um, uh, address uh, labour cost shocks. And um, she uses a particular nice um, uh, policy change, uh, change in the minimum wage in um, 2016, where the minimum wage rose by about 7.5%. Um, and this was an unexpected increase in the minimum wage. Um, and then she examines how firms reacted in terms of raising their productivity. So if you look at a lot of the literature on the minimum wage, there's a huge focus on the impact on employment. But there are, you know, there are other aspects as well. There is some work on the direct productivity impacts of, of the minimum wage. But here they're looking at is how, could firms have raised their productivity following the, 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 the rise in the, in, in the minimum wage by uh, changing the education or the skill demands of, uh, uh, of their workforce demands for new, for new workers. So she what, what she has done is she employs a very standard uh, difference and different strategy. And um, so before and after the policy, but uses a measure of exposure to the minimum wage at the local labor market level in 2014, before the, before the, um, the policy. Um, so she does a very detailed um, analysis of this exposure to the, the minimum wage. And if I had a lot of time, I could show you some nice charts of the country where uh, there's different exposure. So um, she's using the share of ads paying below the minimum wage in 2014 and cross-classifying that into two-digit occupation and travel to work areas. So very local labour market analysis here. Um, about 15% of, of um, ads paid below the minimum wage in 2014. So it is a, it's quite a, a large uh, proportion and therefore you can get a lot of a, a variation in the exposure to the, to the minimum wage. And then what um, she's looking at uh, the, the impact on um, substitution across different types of labour, um, measuring you using both the education qualifications measure that they developed and these tech skills measure. Um, and then what they show is that there is a reduction in the share of um, non-graduate uh, level uh, demand for, for, for workers with non-graduate level qualifications and an increase in demand for ICT skills following the, the national, uh, the increase in national minimum, minimum wage. So, so this is some evidence that the, uh, there's an impact on, on, of the minimum wage um, on employers that they shift towards their more productive wages in order to compensate for the increase in labor costs. So this is a nice kind of application of this data. Um, however, this, this analysis, because it's, to, it's talking about the, minimum wage is confined to the lower end of the skill distribution and we have to think about how we're going to look more at the, at the, the, the higher end of, of that distribution as we use, you know, as we work with the data and um, use it in, in, our, in our analysis of, of, of regional um, uh, labour markets. So this, this work is, a, is at the national level, it's not at the regional level. Okay, the next, um, just a little bit on the supply side. This is work we're looking at. Um, I've been doing with Augustine de Coulin, um at Kings and Larissa Marioni at, um, at NISA. And we've been looking at um, the question of regional mobility. So if we look at trying to match demand and supplies, well, if there's an increase in demand for say high-tech uh, high uh, skills in, in one part of the country, one way uh, of uh, matching that demand is, for, is, is to have people move to uh, to the, the place where the demand is highest. So regional mobility is a very important part of local labour markets. And we've been looking at to try and do some work on this. Um, what we've done so far has been building on some ESCO work on measuring re regional human capital stock, but um, uh, using the lifetime income approach, although we, we, we will be going beyond that particular framework when we look at trying to put uh, demand and supply together. Um, so what we did is we calculated one year transition probabilities to and from regions by gender, age and qualification group. And again, I haven't time to really put any slides up here, but we find that these net transition probabilities to and from regions are, are, are quite high. So they're often in the one year probabilities can be of the order of um, uh, 9, 10, 11% um, from two, kinds, two, two regions and from regions. And But when you look at these... Um, they, they're high, but they're, they're, they're high mostly or almost all the time for the young and the highly skilled. So older people don't move very much and, and the low skilled don't move very much. And um, 
when we've used these, there's these um, transition probabilities then to look at how much impact that has on the regional human capital stocks as, as measured by the ONS. And we've done some simulations on this and that um, suggests that taking account of regional mobility significantly increases the, the, the disparity across the regions. So if you don't take account of the mobility, you get a picture of uh, human capital stock per, per person in regions that are closer together than if you do actually take account of mobility. Right, so, um, and then just with one minute left, um, so just to talk about where, where we're going on this work. So we'll examine further demands for, uh, as I said earlier, we want to look particularly if graduates and non-graduate jobs are, 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 if the skills they're requiring are different from uh, the people who've taken traditionally um, taken those jobs. Um, and on the supply side, we want to refine our mobility estimates because we do want to, um, we th think this is a very important um, aspect. And unfortunately, the UK HLS is the sample sizes are really too small to do very much with this. So we're looking to look at lo using LEO. Uh, this is a longitudinal uh, education outcomes data that only applies to people up to the age, I think now of about 30. But we can see from the raw data that the mobility is really concentrated in that age group. And then we want to bring uh, together the demand and supply side at the regional le le level using data on um, matching the demand and supply through the educational qualifications and the occupations um, to consider this whole question of skill mismatch and the, and the extent to which um, these increased demands can be met by regional mobility. And we would really like to look at international mobility as well if we can bring the data in on that. And then finally, just the last thing we would like to do here is very more ambitious aim is to link to the supply skill produced by the education system. So what we'd like to do is to, is to see to what extent um, the local educational systems are providing the skills that are required by the um, uh, by firms. So if there's an increase in demand by firms for high tech skills, um, do they have to uh, rely on mobility from other regions or, or is, is, is the local labor market, the local education system actually producing the skills they want. Um, young people going to higher education colleges are very mobile, so that's not such a, an issue. But so we'd like to focus here on the, the further education colleges where um, the graduates are tend to be mo uh, uh, less mobile. Um, and uh, this will, this will um, link into some work that the Productivity Institute is doing, doing quite a lot of work on, on FE colleges. Uh, we would like to be able to maybe do, use some web scraping of the, um, the, the modules um, and the, um, the programs available in FE colleges as well, but we're going to, we're, we're starting with a pilot with that. But, um, but this is, a, this is a, an important part of the whole story, I think, that you, you, know, you, you need to link to the, what, what's, what kind of education the people in the local areas are getting, as well as, um, uh, as, well as you know, more, more aggregate data on what proportion of people in the area have various qualifications. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, I think my time is up, yes. <laughs> Not sure if thank, I went over you, thank, or not. <laughs> and thank, thank you, Mary. That's that, that, that's great. Yeah, that, that was a nice overview of part, parts of what is a large package of uh, work going on on various sort of labour market issues on both the supply and the demand side. Um, and I'd like to emphasise the, the, the regional productivity forums that Bart mentioned at the beginning have been quite important in. Um, generating ideas and questions for us and issues on, on, on the local level on, on both the supply and demand for skills. I think you do have to see it very much at the local level. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on there. Um, let me once again invite people to submit uh, questions and comments if they have any um, and hand over to Steve Roper from, from uh, Warwick uh, who will be talking about firms and organizational capital and uh, that strand of work in the Institute. Steve. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, it's my job to try to introduce uh, what uh, in TPI terms is called organizational capital, which is really the firm level uh, aspect to productivity and, and, and wealth creation. I guess that, um, within this organizational capital theme, uh, we've sort of structured a, ring, a range of projects uh, around four main areas, which 
relate to the ways in which a particular locality or a region can actually boost productivity, wealth creation within that sort of area. And so we have some projects around entrepreneurship and its contribution to productivity growth. And this shades over into some of what Mary was talking about around the labor market, uh, but also brings in issues around uh, diversity uh, and uh, migrant communities, for example, potentially. We have some projects, and I'll talk about these a little bit more in a moment, around innovation and net zero, particularly as, the, as Bart mentioned, the importance of that transition in existing firms. So that's very much the contribution of innovation exporting to productivity upgrading in existing firms. Uh, there's a series of projects around foreign direct investment, bringing uh, new productive capital into, into localities, which Nigel Driffield is leading. And then we also have some projects on supply chain upgrading, which Jan Godsell and colleagues are, are involved in. Uh, the organizational capital theme is being led by Nigel Driffield overall from Warwick. Um, and there's an important link between much of the work that we're doing here and the Midlands Regional Productivity Forum, uh, where that, that link to the Productivity Forum is also informing much of the uh, work that's going on in the organisational capital theme and pushing us in some other directions that we hadn't anticipated, but we can maybe come back to that a bit later on. Um, I wanted to focus on one uh, particular piece of work um, that we did uh, last year as part of the TPI programme. Uh, which was really looking at trying to derive some early results about the impact of government support for firms, particularly for SMEs, really, uh, during the uh, COVID-19 crisis, um, or the worst of it, perhaps, the worst couple of years, um, and, and how that actually might influence productivity in the future. So this is a piece of work that's jointly uh, conducted between me, uh, one of our research fellows, Halima Jibril, and Mark Hart at Aston. Um, I'll give you the reference a bit later on for this in a bit more detail. But what we did here was we used data uh, to consider the, to, and, and a bit of econometrics to consider the impact of three UK government support measures, the three main ones during the productivity, during the COVID uh, crisis, uh, a couple of loan schemes and uh, the furlough scheme. And we asked two questions. Um, of course, we don't have data, we don't have real time data on firm productivity. What we do have is some survey data, which gives us some insight into how firms are planning to invest in the future uh, around various types of investment. I think five or six different types of investment, including capital innovation skills. Uh, and then also some data on employee well-being, which we were just happening to collect at the time of the survey uh, of the time of this project. And so we can also test the impact of these government support measures uh, on, on employee well-being. Um, simple, simple structure. Oh, I've lost a slide. Oh, there we are. Sorry. Um, we, so for the investment analysis, we're using data from the SME finance monitor. Uh, for the well-being analysis, we were using some data from our own ERC mental health and well-being survey for last year. Uh, which again gives us uh, uh, an overview of uh, mental health and well-being among the workforce of around 1,500 firms across the Midlands and some idea about firms' use of uh, these government support measures and a bunch of controls. Uh, very simple two-equation structure, instrumenting the treatment, either the measures in isolation, so furlough on its own, grants, sorry, loans on their own, all the combination thereof uh, as the treatment um, and, and a series of firm level controls to see how actually these, uh, these, um, th these different measures or combinations of measures uh, were inf influencing uh, firms' future plans. Um, as Mary said, uh, the excuse for not going into more detail here is Tony's time constriction. So uh, we'll just move on to uh, some of the key results here. I know, Tony, it's a bit rough. Um, so what, what did we find? Um, so we had about uh, 4,000 SMEs go analysis, data on about 4,000 SMEs going into the investment analysis and around 1,500 going into the uh, employee wellbeing analysis. Um, what we found generally across the piece was quite positive uh, average marginal effects. So firms that were getting furlough, uh, the loan schemes or, or the combination, generally had uh, higher intentions to invest 
in future investment across a range of these different uh, uh, different uh, areas, and also to uh, had uh, lower experience of some aspects of bad employee well-being or mental health. So mental health absence, sickness absence, and repeat sickness absence was all lower among firms that were using furlough and a combination of furlough and the uh, and the CBI schemes. We weren't able to estimate. Uh, uh, the impact of the loan schemes on their own on employee well-being because the sample sizes were too small. So uh, NA in this in in, the, in this table. So in the uh, in this analysis, what we found was pretty widespread positive effects of the impact of government support on both of these areas on investment planning uh, and and on employee well-being. Um, and these effects were fairly large. Uh, firms which received a combination of furlough and, uh, and loans were 17.2 percentage points more likely to plan investments and capital investment. And that, that though you saw the similar size of some of those effects uh, in, in the previous chart, and around 9% less likely to report uh, some of the mental health, health absence. So I guess it's a bit early to draw conclusions about productivity benefits here or, uh, or, or TFP more generally. But I guess that if we would think that you know these these contributions to more positive investment intentions and well-being uh, are likely to have uh, more contribute to sustaining productivity uh, in the in the longer term, uh, the reference for the papers there. I guess the downside of this analysis is it was relatively short term. Uh, the, and also it excludes, it's very much around the impact of these measures on the individual firms and doesn't really take into account any of the kind of structural impacts that uh, we might anticipate in terms of, you know, sustaining the life of zombie firms uh, or, or, or anything else. Um, I think just to finish, um, there's work going on 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 the organizational capital theme on all of the four areas I discussed, supply chain, foreign direct investment, uh, the innovation stuff and the entrepreneurship uh, area. In terms of the upgrading innovation and productivity within existing firms, uh, we're very much concerned at the moment around the relationships between innovation, exporting and productivity. And in particular, the way in which different types of innovation influence the probability that firms are able to export and increase their productivity and that links quite a number of the different areas of TPI together. And what we're finding there is a really quite significant difference between the impact of new to the market innovation uh, and new to the firm innovation and the productivity and exporting implications of that. And in a sense that kind of leads you down a, a particular, uh, to have a particular focus on innovation novelty potentially as the key to uh, kind of both export market orientation uh, and, and, and productivity. Uh, more on that uh, as we go forward. But I think, Tony, that is probably all I want to say for the moment. Great. Thank you, Steve. Um, let, let me just add here, as, as, as Bart said at the beginning, there are eight, eight distinct themes, and we're not covering uh, all of them. No way are we trying to be you know, comprehensive uh, in this uh, uh, short, short session. Um, but having said that, you know, let, let me add, there's a large stream of work getting underway on adoption of uh, digital technology, um, or not, yeah, to what extent is the UK lagging uh, or, or slow on this, uh, what are the perceived uh, obstacles, where again it's going to be a combination of um, the academic and pure, pure, pure research, but also engagement with the regional productivity forums and um, re re putting regional detail uh, in, in on that. Uh, so that's possibly something uh, we, we can return to uh, at, at, at the end. Uh, but thank you, Steve. That's great. Um, Rebecca. Um, okay, so um, in my 10-15 minutes, uh, I will um, uh, also talk a bit about what we're doing uh, in the Productivity Institute, uh, specifically around um, measurement and productivity measurement. And um, I, I'll highlight uh, a few recent studies and also um, some forthcoming studies. Um, and I'll start with stating the obvious, um, well, it should be obvious, uh, that measurement matters for understanding productivity. Um, and um, the reason for, for 
for stating this is because I still have this sense that um, one has to argue this case on a regular basis and that um, the measurement agenda isn't you know, as widely acknowledged in mainstream economics. So hence, hence that uh, phrase. In any case, obviously productivity is all about measuring outputs correctly, measuring the associated inputs correctly and the conversion factor between these two things, be able to understand that. Apologies for the noise in the background. Um, so, you know, measurement is obviously crucial on a number of levels of levels to that. And I mean, Mary, for example, highlighted you know, some detailed understanding of some of the inputs around human capital. Um, but there's also some other very big issues um, in measuring productivity, which probably have come to the fore since the um, since the productivity slowdown after the great financial crisis in the UK, but also the slowdown in productivity that Bart highlighted as well, uh, more broadly in advanced economies. So I'm going to talk about some of those issues here. I've listed them, there's four of them that I wanted to highlight. Uh, drawing on a, a forthcoming uh, paper, uh, which I've referred to down at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and it forms the basis of our thinking uh, in this theme and also uh, for our work going forward. So, I mean, the first, the first point is around measuring volumes uh, and, and, uh, and values. And you know, I mean, I think there was a paper in the Journal of Political Economy uh, by uh, Feldstein in 2017, and that paper reviewed very extensively the difficulties in actually distinguishing between what is a value and uh, what is a volume. And of course, the key there is measuring prices. And his conclusion was that there were substantial errors of unknown size um, that remain in our ability to measure both real output and inflation. And I think his conclusion was that inflation is probably overestimated and growth underestimated. But there's, you know, so this is an ongoing agenda and, and um, there's disagreement about how much this matters for actually understanding recent productivity developments. So um, some would say these difficulties in distinguishing between volumes and values actually contribute to the observed productivity slowdown that we see. Others would say, well, um, no, that's not the case. We've always had these issues and there's no reason why that should contribute to uh, to recent developments. So there's, you know, there's a mixed, a mixed set of views there and also a mi mixed set of frameworks for trying to disentangle these things. Uh, the, the ONS recently uh, produced experimental estimates of double deflation. Um, and I think, you know, in that exercise, we're able to take into account a different measure of uh, price, uh, of prices of telecoms. So this is an area where there's been huge uh, technological development prices uh, may have been overestimated or inflation may have been overestimated. They've implemented that uh, in, in their double deflated experimental estimates. And indeed that does show that or on those estimates, the productivity puzzle in the UK at least is, is uh, slightly, slightly weaker than previously thought. On the um, location of production, there's some big issues here as well. Um, the, one of the studies that you may be familiar with, with was uh, done in the US by Gouvenin and co-authors. They analyzed um, issues around firms' as profit shifting. So a lot of production takes place in multinational companies uh, and they have an ability to shift, um, for example, intangibles around. Uh, and, and this can of course result in a disjuncture between where things are produced and where they're recorded. And of course, that's also very relevant for productivity measurement. Uh, colleagues Giordano Mion and Manuel Tong have recently done an exercise looking at this for the UK. Um, but you know, I mean, the, the, the big example here is, is that the, the, it's the case of Ireland, uh, which um, you know, it had GDP growth of 26% or something like that in 2015. And this was because of these types of issues with firms uh, moving things around uh, to different locations and values um, and inputs being recorded in different places. So big, big issues there as well. Boundary issues. So what do we include within the production boundary is again, an issue for productivity measurement. Um, and, you know, household production is the, is the uh, traditional example there. And there's a household satellite account. I don't know if you if you had the chance to see a special session yesterday, which was organized by Josh Martin uh, and Cleona Taylor, where they uh, did discuss uh, the spectrum that Bart put up at the beginning of this session. Um, 
the spectrum uh, of GDP, where we sort of move from market sector GVA to GDP to sort of more extended measures that take into account um, things that currently are outside the production boundary and move into a, a welfare space. And you know, they they've with existing data have tried to populate some of those things and. Uh, certainly for growth uh, in the last decade, it would appear that household production seems to be uh, very important, but we don't know what that actually means for productivity uh, because we need to have the input side there as well. Um, now, and again, this is also a key issue when we think about um, the digital economy. So uh, there's been a lot of work around um, the value of, of, of digi free digital goods, um, they, they are they, they are not priced, therefore they're not included uh, within within GDP. But we we get value from them. So there's this concern that there's this increased disjuncture between the welfare that we get from a given level of GDP. And you know, Brynjolfsson's work with with colleagues uh, suggests that this could have significant effects on TFP in the United States of the order of magnitude of 0.05 to 0.11 for one single free digital good, Facebook. So um, you know, th these are really quite significant issues if we want to try and understand productivity. I'll skip over missing capitals. Um, there was a very nice lunchtime session on Monday uh, where uh, Parta Gupta and Diane Coyle discussed uh, things, nature as a missing capital, but we can think of intangibles as, um, as something that we typically don't uh, consider sufficiently. So if I could just move forward. Um, so the, with those things in mind, when we think about productivity here in the UK, but also elsewhere, you know, we can think about, well, we have this productivity as this, you know, we need to understand output input the conversion rate. What is it that's happened to the production function? We're not measuring it or analyzing it as well as maybe we could because things have changed over time. Production is increasingly global, digital, knowledge-based, et cetera. So, we need to move beyond the standard growth accounting analyses to understand productivity. And that sort of forms the basis for what we do uh, here with the Productivity Institute. Um, I've highlighted here a few things that we're considering, uh, which, you know, around new methodologies or data for understanding productivity and production structures. So um, one of these is around the understanding, uh, measuring uh, the value of, of, of free digital goods uh, and this builds on work by Brynjolfsson that I just highlighted before. I'll just go to this slide. This is not meant for you to absorb. I'm just trying to advertise a forthcoming uh, paper that will come out in the Productivity Institute discussion paper series and also probably the ESCO discussion paper series is, is, has been carried out by John Lawrence Pokis, uh, who is a PhD student here at King's College London, and who will be taking this agenda forward with Kevin Fox uh, in, in um, in the uh, Uni University of New South Wales. What, the, what this uh, table is meant to highlight is it, this, this highlights, he's tried to make things comparable in this, in this table, but the key point here is there's been several attempts to try and value these free digital goods um, and with different methods, for example, experiments where we ask, where people are asked to forego a particular free digital good for a period of time and what would they be willing to, to uh, give up for that in terms of money terms. Um, some of these experiments are incentive compatible. So they really, there, there are financial incentives to, to provide the correct values, et cetera. Uh, others have looked at, have tried to elicit this information from uh, surveys like uh, the work by David Nguyen and Diane Coyle uh, recently. Um, and John Lawrence has been um, using a different methodology altogether uh, and comes up with uh, estimates that are at the lower end of what we see in this table. The point, the point here is just to say, do read the paper when it comes out, but there are very, very significant differences in valuations that have been collected through um, these different methodologies. So the, what we're trying to do uh, in the, with the Productivity Institute is to try and understand why we get these differences. Can we find a methodology that we could actually implement and that would provide a stable set of, of, of figures. Um, so that was around measuring digital economy. Um, the, we're, we're doing some work on intangibles as well. Uh, and this is um, partially exploring uh, different production function frameworks with microdata, but also 
um, you know, this sort of acknowledging the the framework put forward by Jonathan Haskell um, that you know intangibles have different properties to other capital inputs. They're sunk, scalable. Uh, they have synergies and spillovers. Um, trying to explore how we might model those things and better understand how intangibles uh, create value and create productivity. Um, and that involves case studies as well. Finally, I just wanted to highlight one other thing that we're doing, uh, which is around um, large-scale firm-level data sets. So um, you'll be aware of the fantastic work done by the OECD using um, comparable micro data sets across different countries to illustrate some of the stylized facts about firm level productivity, its distribution, um, business dynamism, et cetera. And um, they have you know, looked at that for a lot of countries. The UK typically isn't included in these studies because uh, the, the, we have some disparities in our firm level data sets uh, and you know, they're probably not as fully, fully utilized as they could be. Uh, so again, that's an area where we want to, um, to to build the infrastructure, basically, and try and look at some of these issues uh, for the UK as well. And I'll just advertise another paper. Um, this is a paper that was published in 2020 uh, in the ESCO discussion paper series by colleagues at the ONS. They are building a longitudinal business database. This is uh, under construction uh, or continual development, but they have... Um, try to develop the spine underlying um, uh, the business uh, business surveys and brought in new data sets uh, to this exercise uh, and have been able to look at job creation and job destruction in the UK and find a slowdown in both um, gross job creation and destruction before and after the great financial crisis as has also been found in some other countries. So just to say that that's also um, an area of investigation and uh, by all means, have a look at this paper. Um, and I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Rebecca. Obviously the uh, measurement and methods theme, having, having a strong measurement and methods theme is really important and underpins so much of what's going on uh, in the Institute. And it's great to see these sort of rather, you know, I mean, really nice, really fascinating questions about you know, what happens to the production function uh, being addressed at all at all levels. Um, so um, thank you, Rebecca. You're chairing the next. I I, I don't you. understand how. So, so sorry. Um, I not sure how to unshare my screen for you. Yeah, you are excused to go and sort out uh, preparing for the next session. But please un unshare your screen. Okay, <laughs> before thank you. you. Do so. Okay, uh, I, I don't. I uh... um, Rebecca, I did it from my end just to. Oh, thank so you so much. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Rebecca. We understand you have to uh, run, run off for, for that next session. Okay, I won't try and introduce myself, but I will ask uh, whether I am successfully sharing that screen. Yes, fine, Tony. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. Yeah, so let me um, talk about um, some of the work going on uh, under the geography in place theme uh, of, of, of the Institute. Now you've already, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's pretty sort of self-evident that uh, re regional disparities are inherent and probably quantitatively rather large part of, of the UK productivity problem. And obviously it's, uh, it's an issue that crops up uh, across so many of the things we're doing. Um, we've already seen our know, skills, uh, firm location decisions, um, governments, uh, all, all being areas where the regional dimensions are really important. So regions are coming up across the board um, and we have a particular specific theme on geography in place. Um, obviously that theme is asking some of the big questions, you know, the measurement ones, uh, to what extent is the productivity problem a regional problem? Um, which isn't quite as clear cut as people think. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, regional problem is really important, uh, but the claims that, you know, regional disparities in Britain are greater than anywhere else in the developed world um, need, need to be questioned rather, rather critically, I think. So we're addressing big questions, yeah. To what extent is productivity a regional problem? 
what are the causes of regional disparities? Um, governance issues, skills, investment choices, um, both private sector investment choices, location decisions of firms, inward investment, um, and of course, public uh, investment decisions, uh, infrastructure, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, looking at the causes, the diagnoses, uh, and also policy responses, uh, both in terms of you know, government levelling up policy, uh, but also more and more broadly, how, how to think about this. Okay, well, I'm going to do what, uh, what I asked other speakers to do, and having given the briefest overview of the big questions, actually uh, focus in on one angle, you know, one particular piece of work uh, that, that, that I've been engaged, engaged in, um, well, over, over several years in, in different, different shapes and forms. And the, 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 the angle I want to take is, well, what, what, what's the role of you know, sexual composition? Um, you know, does it matter what, what places do? Uh, what, what activities are going on in different places? Um, I think to people on the ground, you know, that's of first order importance. Um, but I also think it's probably probably fair to say it's 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 rather under research, rather little thinking about that, and indeed is dismissed in parts of the literature as being sort of you know rather, rather secondary. Uh, a point I, I I disagree with, because when we think about sexual composition, yeah, you know, why why should that matter? Well, I mean there are two basic reasons. One is just a you know, pretty mechanical direct composition effect. You know, some sectors pay more than others, and if you've got one of those sectors, you know, that's great. So there's a direct compositional thing. But I think I hope to persuade you uh, that much more importantly, there's an equilibrium effect. You know, some sectors can sort of raise activity in an area and make the sector boom. Others uh, have um, potentially rather perverse effects. Um, uh, leaving leaving places uh, in not a good shape. So that's the angle I want to talk about for 10 minutes or so, or whatever uh, whatever I have given myself. And it's going to draw on a recent, very nearly a complete paper uh, with, with Patricia Rice. Okay, let me let me start with a bit of background, no, a bit of some broad, broader picture stuff. I mean, I think I think I can say it's pretty, pretty well known, pretty much agreed that a lot of the current problems of uh, UK regional inequalities, disparities, really came out of the, uh, the deindustrialization shocks of the 1970s and 80s. You know, looking back over the economic history of that period, uh, which most people in the audience probably won't remember, um, you know, there really was you know, one shock after another and, and sectors uh, disappearing. Places using, losing their traditional uh, comparative advantage, very often in, in, in big export sectors or at least tradable goods sectors. So those massive shocks uh, in the 70s and 80s in particular. And the second aspect of that is those, you know, I mean, 1970s was a, was a long time ago, but the, the effects of those shocks have been astonishingly persistent. Um, so some, some work I did, if you look at the most the most deprived local authority districts in the UK now, um, doing some sort of rough cutoffs for the sake of exposition, about two thirds of them um, were places that had massive negative shocks in the 1970s. And those two thirds were sort of on average, pretty average looking places in the 60s and 70s, had, had these shocks and you know, two generations on. Um, yeah, now it's still showing up in these, these deprivation levels. So, so, so massive persistence, something to do with sexual change, structural change uh, in the 70s and 80s. Okay, I think also think it's pretty obvious, you know, what the adjustment mechanisms should have been and, and why they didn't work. I mean, in simplest terms, you know, if a place gets a negative shock, there are two adjustment mechanisms. One is people move out and the other is jobs move in. Well, we know that people moving out is is, is, is slow and problematic. You know, it's, it's the young and the more able that go um, we're all economists, so we know that it's the fixed factor that really takes the hit. So if the fixed factor of the old people, uh, the less skilled people, house prices, uh, they're, they're the things that take the hit when there's, 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 there's a negative shock. Mobile factors uh, move. The other mechanism that we'd like to think works rather well is that uh, jobs move in. 
But of course, that's actually where I think the sort of fundamental market failure is here. Um, for tradable good sectors in particular, um, you have a choice of where to produce. Uh, and location decisions in those sectors uh, tend to be pretty sticky. Uh, that sounds a bit of a bit, bit as if I just contradicted myself. Uh, you have a choice where to produce because you can trade, but once you're there, you're getting lock in effects and agglomeration and um, all that stuff. So it's really you know, quite difficult to start a new Silicon Valley somewhere yeah, in the uh, West Midlands, um, much as you might wish to do so. So there's that sort of adjustment failure, a failure. Um, but let me sort of go, go a, a bit deeper into this. So what is the role of sectors, tradability, their tradability in particular in, in shaping uh, economic performance uh, in, in places? Let me say now, when I'm using the word tradability, I mean it in a very elastic sense. You know, there's stuff that's perfectly internationally traded, there's stuff that's traded nationally, regionally, locally, or really just within a hundred yard radius. So I'm going to use it in, in that very elastic way um, appropriately, I think. And what I want to do is say a little bit about, you know, some of some evidence that I think suggests that uh, sectoral structure and that tradability dimension in particular does really matter uh, for, for earnings and for measured productivity. Uh, what you do matters, what a surprise. And then a little bit about some of the rather simple mechanisms that, uh, that, that create that, that empirical result. Okay, let me go straight to the empirical result. Um, suppose we can measure tradability, and I'm going to proxy it by something called sparsity bias, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a moment. Well, I'd better talk about it right now, in fact. Sparsity bias, well, let me do it properly. Sparsity at the sectoral level is a measure of the extent to which a sector is concentrated in few places. Not sure sparsity is really the best word for it. Think of it as the opposite of ubiquity, if you like. You know, haircuts are everywhere. Um, nuclear engineering is in one place. So nuclear engineering is sparse, well, a few places. Um, haircuts are ubiquitous. Okay, so for each sector, you can construct a measure of uh, the sparsity, the sectoral concentration, uh, sorry, the spatial concentration uh, of the sector. And then, of course, you can aggregate that up in an employment-weighted way to the uh, sparsity bias of particular places. So some places um, have sectors that are, that, that, that are themselves sparse, you know, finance being a good example of one of those, um, as just as shipbuilding was or, you know, heavy, heavy industries were. Uh, others have sectors that are not sparse, warehousing, backroom stuff, government offices, those sorts of jobs. If you construct that measure, um, then you do actually find a rather robust and powerful relationship, which is the scatter plot on the left there, which is area sparsity bias um, on the horizontal, the mean hourly earnings uh, in the place uh, on the vertical. The red dots, if you can see uh, color on your screen, are London uh, ITL threes, or, or NUTS three as we used to call them, uh, London, London districts. Um, so unsurprisingly, London has um, an employment structure skewed towards very sparse sectors, uh, London ITL three areas, but it's not only London, okay? That positive relationship is in, in the data. Is, is, is remarkably, uh, astonishingly uh, strong. So that suggests powerfully that it does matter uh, what you do. Well, as I said at the beginning, you know, one, one, what, why does it matter? There, there are two mechanisms. One, one is the composition effect. It's obvious, right? Um, it just happens to be the case that uh, sectoral sparsity indices are cor positively correlated with sector earnings. You know, finance is sparse and finance pays well. I just take that to be a consequence of the technologies of, of trade and employment in those sectors as they currently are. Okay, so that's just a correlation out there. But the more interesting mechanism is, 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 is what I'm calling the equilibrium effect. So what I mean by that is, yeah, suppose a place has a productivity advantage uh, in, in, in one sector. 
and think of that as being exogenous. So just sort of Cardian uh, yeah, productivity advantage for the, for the sake of argument. How does that affect uh, what's going, how, and how does that affect the place? Well, if you've got a product productivity advantage in a tradable sector, tradable sectors have high demand elasticities. I mean, think small open economy, right? That's by assumption an infinite demand elasticity. Um, so a little productivity advantage there, it's gonna give you a very large quantity response, uh, not much of a price response, a sort of flat demand curve. It's gonna raise employment, it's gonna raise the cost of living, it's gonna raise nominal earnings, you know, that's a perfect labor mobility here, if you like, but uh, the cost of living has gone up. So wages are going to be high in places that have productivity advantages in trade, highly tradable sectors. But of course, if you've got some productivity advantage in a non-tradable sector, um, that's almost surely got a much lower demand elasticity. So productivity advantage does not give you a quantity response. On the contrary, I'm mean, well, not on the contrary. Uh, instead of that, it gives you gives you a price reduction. So you're getting little employment change, lower cost of living, price reduction. So a possible reduction in nominal earnings in the place. Again, you know, think of that operating through through the cost of living. So actually a physical productivity increase in a non-tradable sector um, might be measured as a reduction in value productivity, right? So you're getting completely different equilibrium responses uh, out of those two things. Okay, two forces at work there, which is more important, which one matters? Well, a little um, regression there, the left-hand column is just the scatter plot that we saw a moment ago, with, with and without London. So yeah, sparsity bias in the place is uh, a fairly significant uh, variable uh, in that relationship with, with hourly earnings. And it's mainly the competition, sorry, it's mainly the equilibrium effect that does it. Uh, certainly for the UK as a whole, um, that's so once you take out London. Um, it's the equilibrium effect that does it. In other words, your small productivity advantage in a tradable sector really pulls the whole place along. Um, pulling up earnings, raising the cost of living, the equilibrium effect, whereas uh, non-tradable and low sparsity bias so really all this is doing is saying, if I can move to conclusions, all it's doing is making this un unsurprising ob observation that what places do matters. Just getting at that mechanically through you know, decomposition effects, and the, and the variation in sectoral earnings isn't gonna give you the full story. It's an equilibrium response. Um, these are obvious points, but I think they have sort of big implications. Uh, physical productivity and value productivity, as Rebecca said, you, we'd better be thinking carefully about those. Um, in in non-tradables, an increase in physical productivity might bring about a fall in measured value productivity, because if the demand is you don't need that, it's is low, price is falling. Uh, to go back to the, uh, once you start thinking in these terms, you really start thinking, well, adjustment processes and a lot of regional policies are devoted to bringing in all these non-tradable low, low value activities into a place. So really they're embedding the problem. Um, you know, they might be creating short run, un, short run employment, which is great, but they're embedding a, a longer, longer term structural problem uh, in the place. And a final concluding comment, this matters at the regional level, but let's think nationally as well. If the underlying market failure here is this sticky location decision of, of firms in tradable sectors, you know, they don't, you know, Silicon Valley doesn't want to move out of Silicon Valley. If that's the underlying market failure. Then we're going to be in a world where there are multiple equilibria. Um, you know, you lose a tradable sector and you don't get another one back automatically. Instead, you just fill up with warehouses and that sort of stuff. That's true regionally. It's true nationally. So, you know, a country, you know, two, two countries identical in fundamentals, one might have lost a lot of tradable sectors and have been doing rather poorly uh, for that reason. 
Okay, let me stop there. Um, I've obviously taken only slightly more than the time I've allotted to other people. Um, I will see if I can manage this challenge of ending sharing of the screen. Uh, I will invite questions uh, from uh, the audience. Please do feel free to type things in to the chat. Uh, not to the chat, you can't see that. Uh, I will try and see if I can recover the moderator screen, which I can and have. Um, so if I can invite you know, questions or comments uh, from, from the audience, we've given tried to give a flavor of what the Productivity Institute does. And if I can also invite Bart uh, to come back, giving him uh, a penultimate uh, couple of words on all the things that the Institute is doing that we have not been able to cover in this, uh, this hour and a quarter so far uh, in this session. So Bart, would you like to uh, come, come in on, on, on this? Sure, if there are no questions for now, I, I'm happy to share a little bit where we're, where we're heading in terms mm -hmm. of our research program. I mean, we are um, uh, just over a year and a half on the way now. So, uh, and you've seen from the flavor of discussions that, that, and presentations today that we, we, we're covering a lot here and then even are not comprehensive. So what we need to do now and what we are going to do is that this research also has given us a good feel for um, where, where we're heading in terms of more focus uh, and what are the things that really are going to, in our view, make a difference to get our hands on solutions, if you like, uh, or deeper diagnosis of where the productivity issues are. So I can share my screen uh, and just sort of take you quickly through. And in the meantime, if people have any more questions or any of my colleague panel members want to respond to that, that would be, be quite useful. You, you could roughly divide our focus in going forward into sort of three main areas of all of which you've heard a bit of today. So one is uh, obviously a whole area of labor markets and skills, the link to health and well-being, which has come back in uh, various presentations, obviously Mary's, but also Stephen has uh, spoken about this extensively. So there's a lot of work that we need to do around this skills mismatch, um, which at the national level is whether we, whether we have overall the right education system to deliver the right skill set, but also this sort of regional and sectoral thinking about do we have the right skills in the right sectors and in the right place. And this is partly a supply issue, but it is as much a demand issue uh, about understanding and which, which sectors and which industries are asking these skills. Linked to this is the issue of precarious employment and the flexibility of the labor markets uh, and, and well-being and some of the underlying questions of that. So that's one block of work that we believe is quite important. Obviously it ties in with a lot of the, the work that we've seen in other sessions at this conference on labor markets. The second main area is uh, technology creation and diffusion and innovation, but also net zero. So uh, I already mentioned when I presented the main themes that when we think about the sort of big research topics is digital transformation, net zero transition that are, are some of the key aspects. And we believe that actually the link between the two is actually a potential area of further research because frankly, you know, it would be a fairly safe hypothesis to say that if we just sort of go along with uh, the drive toward net zero without thinking through how to use technologies better and how to make better use of digital technology, the productivity effects of this may actually be quite disappointing if not detrimental. Uh, to, uh, 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 to, to, to what we're trying to solve here in terms of driving productivity. So we think this combination of uh, looking at technology and the diffusion and absorption of those technologies uh, in light of the climate uh, transition and net zero is, is a critical uh, second area of research. And then finally, the final area of research is of course most clearly came back also in Tony's uh, uh, presentation is the, the area of place in relation to institutions and policies. So where are the places for the most productive investments? Uh, what is the governance? We didn't talk much about that part of, of the work that we're doing. What is the governance and institutional structure that we make around it? And if the, the final issue that we didn't talk about is the role of finance in this respect and whether we do have the right finance mechanisms, again, in the right place uh, and, fo and, uh, and focusing on the, on the right firm. So one, one issue, for example, is, is the issue of uh, the uh, collateralization of intangibles. When the economy becomes more intangible, 
uh, you know, do we also have the right uh, uh, finance mechanisms around it? Some work that's also been addressed in other work, for example, by Jonathan Haskell in his, in his latest book that was just published uh, on restarting the future. So those are sort of three main blocks where I think the Productivity Institute on the basis of the insights produced so far is seeking sort of more focus in the next few years. And uh, Tony, let me just stop there if you want to add anything or uh, Stephen or Mary, or if there's any more questions on the chat. Yes, let me invite um, if, if, if Mary or Stephen now want, want to come in briefly, that will be fine. Now it seems we lost them entirely. Okay, Stephen is checking his plugs. <laughs> Let's pull the wrong one out. <laughs> Mary, any Mary, thoughts? I don't, know, I don't know if you've got any um, thoughts. Um, I'm going to draw this to a close in just, uh, just a moment or two. But, uh, um, Mary, sorry, you Tony, you before you draw to... Hi, sorry, Tony, before you draw to uh, uh, close, there's a question if you want to... It's not in moderator view, there isn't. Sorry. Okay, so there, it's there, there's one in the chat. So I think it's a general question. If uh, so, Keshav has asked, what is the best way to construct a sparsity index for the UK regions? That's just the only question there. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank, thank you for reading that out. I really can't see it anywhere. Um, yeah. So what we want to measure is tradability. Um, we're measuring it as a, by, by what I call sparsity. So that's a matter of um, looking at the distribution of employment in a sector um, across regions. And then you can ask, well, what aspect of that distribution are you going to measure? What we actually measure is the skewness of the location quotients. That's a little bit odd, but if you think about um, what we want to get at is the tradability and tradability mapped through a demand function, an isoelastic demand function where you have an elasticity um, creates, um, you know, if elasticity is less than one, it's going to be concave. The, concave transformation, it's greater than one, it's a convex transformation, it's really stretching stuff out into the right tail. So yeah, for, for each industry, for each of 600 odd uh, nice sectors, or it's, it's, it's fine. Um, get this distribution of location quotients across places, get, get, look at the distribution, take a statistic from the distribution and we use skewness, right? So that gives you the sector sparsity indices and then the place sparsity bias is the employment weighted average of those sector sparsity indices, sector by sector. Um, variance rather than skewness does a pretty good job because uh, obviously you're, 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 the, the trade of things, you're, 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 you're stretching out uh, the, the, the distribution. Um, but skewness actually is, I think, theoretically correct and does better, which is quite pleasing. I hope that answered the, the question. Thank you for it. Okay, I think we've lost Steve altogether. Um, I, um, no, we haven't. He's waiting to be admitted, which is apparently in my power. Remarkable. Well, well welcome back, Steve. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Tony, about that. That's all right. I was on the verge of, um, we, we've had a short discussion about sparsity indices, um, but you were going to come in on, on something? Uh, yes, only about the the, the sort of uh, TPI data lab, really. Uh, yeah. And just, just to say that, you know, sitting alongside the, the methods theme that uh, Rebecca and colleagues are working on, you know, there is this aspiration to develop, um, you know, some some sort of um, some sort of bit, some sort of USP in terms of specific data assets, and I think that that is important for us in terms of linking together a number of the different uh, research themes and potentially advancing some of the agendas that Bart was talking about before. Um, so that I think is one of the most, alongside the kind of research projects that Bart, research directions that Bart was talking about, that will be one of the kind of big themes of the next, your sort of year or 18 months in terms of what we're trying to do. 
Exactly. That's, thanks for bringing that up, Stephen. And indeed, if, if people have produced research and data sets that, you know, that like other people to use or that like other people to access, it's actually sort of a one-stop shop for productivity related data. We're not trying to sort of reinvent the wheel here, but basically try to provide an, a function for people who come into the Productivity Institute's uh, website uh, to basically drive them to a place where they can access these data sets. So please feel free to reach out. And obviously, once you start populating it, feel free also to be welcome to visit it and hopefully make good use of it. OK, I'm just going to have myself and then wrap, wrap up. The, the website for the Productivity Institute is www.productivity.ac.uk. So I would uh, invite people to, to visit that. There are discussion papers up there, uh, policy inside papers, and of course, an overview of all, of all the activities. Um, so, so please do look at uh, productivity.ac.uk. Thanks to the panelists. Uh, thanks uh, for those attending. Uh, and of course, thanks for the SRC for supporting the entire project and the Royal Economic Society for um, putting on this event. So thank you all, and we'll finish at this point. Thank Thanks, you. Tony. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye.